good morning and welcome to Christian Fellowship. Let's see. Uh, uh, bonjour, madames, mademoiselle, uh, monsieur. Um, that's it. That's all I got. I, I was, we're in Haiti. Got a little bit of Creole. That's that's kind of the beginning and the end. Um, Joe Mickelson, my brother-in-law, and I uh, had the uh, the opportunity to spend a week in Haiti. Um, our service today is going to be drastically different than what we normally do. If there is a normal, I guess two weeks ago I had a tent sitting up on stage, so maybe maybe there really is no normal, not sure. But this morning we're going to walk you through what we believe God is calling us as a church to do in Haiti and what our responsibility is, what we, what we think he's really challenging us to. We um, were greeted uh, at the airport, kind of. Um, I... Um, I, there's really not a good way to explain this, but when you get off the airplane and you pick up your luggage, as soon as you leave the door, you're in the process of getting fleeced. That's how you get out of the airport. You have to pay somebody. I'm not sure if they have a small room they keep you in if you don't pay, um, but you basically get uh, fleeced to get out of the airport. I knew this. I shared this with Joe. Um, I happened to have seen our contact and waved and went and gave him a big hug and Joe was about 75 feet behind me, so he didn't see the wave. He didn't see the hug. Then we got in a vehicle with people that he thought were taking us to another land. Um, it was really, a, a f that's how it started. And it went uphill from there? Yeah. <laughs> we survived. We survived. Um, our normal trek from the airport up to the mission's house would have been 45 minutes, and there was an accident in front of us. Uh, so it took us two hours just to get from where we were back around to the main highway, if that's what you want to call it. Anyhow, uh, this morning we're going to share with you again what, not only what took place in our hearts, but what we feel God is calling us. This is our second time there, and we've had connections um, with Haiti that go back 15 years in the church. And so we want to share what we really believe God is calling us to do. And you look around I mean, really, look around. Look around the church. You see, well, that's a pretty small church, Pastor. I'm not really sure that you can accomplish all of that. And that's kind of the reality. We can't. But through him, all things are possible. Amen? All right, let's, uh, let's open this morning with a word of prayer. By the way, this is more casual than any, you know, some of the, they might wear something like this in Haiti, but uh, not, not often. This is, this is way casual for church in Haiti. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's just start with a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for your life. God, I pray right now for uh, churches in this community who are meeting in the name of Jesus Christ. They're, they're discussing, they're worshiping your son. They're talking about who God is. They're talking about the life and the hope that we have in Christ. Father, there are churches, we have friends now and, and family in Haiti that are worshiping you this morning. And they're doing the same exact thing. They're, they're pouring out their hearts to you. And, and expressing their need. And so, Father, I just pray that you'd, you'd meet us, you'd, you'd, your presence would be here, God. We would sense that, that there is a welcomeness, that there is an openness. We would sense that, that your heart is here for us, God. And, and across the world, literally. God, I, I, again, I think of our friends that are just in such, uh, such absolute poverty. And yet they gather before you and they pour out their heart in song and in worship. And, and Lord, we, we have absolutely nothing, nothing to complain about. Um, so God, I, I pray for your heart to just reside on this service. I pray that you will, Father, you'll orchestrate this, this thing. I'm not really sure how to, how to do it any other way other than just put our confidence and our trust in you that you're going to walk us through this morning. We, we submit our hearts to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to stand with us and worship the Lord. And if you get partway through and say, ah, you know what, I just need to sit down. Well, then sit down. You can worship the Lord with your, with your, hearts, uh, uh, with your, with your hearts while you're sitting. That's okay. But uh, I just want to encourage you to stand and worship the Lord this morning. <coughs>
give us a greater glimpse of a never-changing God. All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you, found in you. All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
is worth trusting in. We thank you for your promises of love and of hope, of forgiveness and faithfulness. We thank you that you are a holy and righteous God. And you are here for us each and every moment. Thank you, Father God. We can trust in you. Our soul relies on you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. we 
to call on at any time. And we just do that today, Father. We just call on your name. We call on your name, God, because you truly are all we need.
not falter, you will not fail. For you are strong to save. give you this time, Father. Touch our hearts. Stir the sparks. Cause a flame. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you say good morning to someone and have a seat. We are going to receive our morning offering. Um, look at that. I just grabbed a Kleenex because I know I'm going to need one here in a while. Um, I, I just want to say about our offering, I, I just want to thank you so much for your giving. You're going to see as we, uh, as we go through the presentation this morning, part of what your, what your offering goes to, part of what, what that pays for. And when we do outreach, folks, um, you know if you've been here any length of time, we don't take second offerings, we don't take third offerings, we don't take extended offerings. You bring your gifts into the church, and it's the church's responsibility to disperse those resources. And there are times when, when maybe you know, we'll have that opportunity, but, but right now I just want to say thank you so much for giving faithfully to this work here. So, Father, I thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you so much for your life. Lord, you have provided for us in ways that we, as Americans, God, we can't even begin to understand the level at which you have provided for us. So, God, we are so grateful. We are so, so grateful. Your, your word says that we're supposed to give. We're supposed to give back into your kingdom. And then your word says, as we give, you'll give back to us, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And I believe, God, that you do that so we can further the kingdom instead of absorbing it all on ourselves. So God, I pray that you'd give us wisdom as leaders to do that. And, and God, I just ask you to bless each person here who, who is able to give this morning. And Father, I pray that you just pour back into their lives in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Amen. I got, I got an amen back there. That's good. Um, just a couple of announcements of the bulletin. Um, you should have received a bulletin when you came in. Again, today we're going to share a, a missions report. Uh, tomorrow night we have a missions committee meeting. Is that correct, Kim? I, did I see you? We have a missions committee meeting, so if you're part of that missions team, please uh, uh, be here in my office at uh, 7 o'clock. And some other things that are going on. Next week is Palm Sunday. Good morning, dear. Um, next week is Palm Sunday. And then on Good Friday, we're going to have our Good Friday service here at 5 o'clock. Previous to that, Cowboy Church out on the highway. Most of you know Cowboy Church down on Highway 34. They do what's called a crosswalk. They start down in the city park, and they carry a cross. Um, it's on wheels, but they just walk up the main street and then cross over onto Highway 10, and it's a 16-mile walk, and we've been invited to join them. Um, so if at any point along the way you'd like to hop in for an hour or two, um, and then I know that they're going to have a, uh, a video out there after that. I believe they're going to do the war room out there after that. Um, we'll be having our 
our uh, Good Friday service here as well. So I just want to encourage you if you want to be a part of that. Also, Easter morning, we're going to have a sunrise breakfast from 8 to 9. I know that's not really sunrise, but it's about as close as we get from 8 to 9, and our services from 9 to 10. And Cowboy Church is going to be joining us that morning. So I just want to encourage you to come and to, to be a part of that. And uh, it's our heart's desire to just to work with the body of Christ, and we have that opportunity to do that with Cowboy Church. Barry. Thank you. First of all, I would just want to mention that at 7.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time yesterday morning, Heaven's Gates opened wide to accept Beulah Durstein, oh, who has been promoted hallelujah. to glory. And that's a good report. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> the second thing I want to mention is there's about 100 copies of this book out in the hallway. You're welcome to take one per family, or if you know somebody else, it says, Healed of Cancer. It was written by a lady named Dodie Osteen, who 43 years ago was told she had three weeks to live because she had inoperable liver cancer. Everybody say 43 years ago. She rejected medical treatment. There was none anyway for her, but God is bigger. So if you'd like to get a copy of this book, if you know somebody that's struggling with some kind of a health issue, needs to believe God, or if you want to know how we're believing God, Read this book. It's very short, very powerful. Many of you have asked about um, visiting Sharon. We request that rather than visit her, you would express your appreciation for her in written form. Send her a letter, write her a note, tell her what she means to you, tell her you're praying for her, give her a scripture of some kind that will encourage her. She's not in a position to accept a lot of visits right now. And so thank you for that. And the last item is the Bible reading Marathon, we're planning to have it on June 1 to 6. We need 84 people who will take responsibility for one hour. And in that one hour, recruit six people to read 10 minutes, five people to read 12 minutes, four people to read 15 minutes, whatever. By signing up for that one hour block, you're saying, I'll make sure somebody is reading during that entire hour. We'll let you know who's going to be in charge of that. I cannot do it at the present time because of my situation with Sharon, but we're looking for people to help. So if you're interested in this, if you participated last year, you've got a heart for it, uh, let me know and I'll refer you to the proper people. Thank you. Very good, very good. I, again, I just want to say, you know, the Bible reading marathon last year, just so that you know, um, we believe that God's Word is powerful. We believe that according to God's Word, it's sharper than a double-edged sword and it it will accomplish what it is sent out to do. So we simply sat in the pavilion down at the park or in a small pavilion, and we just read God's word out loud. And you say, well, boy, that seems kind of, it seems kind of nothing. It's God's word, so it's kind of everything. We were able to sit there and to just read it. We didn't make some big show of it. If you would are willing to take 10 minutes or if you're willing to uh, cover an hour. Uh, I signed up the other day for an hour, so I'm going to try and recruit six of you to come down and help me. Well, five, because I'll read for 10 minutes. So uh, I, there's only, I only got five more to go. So I just want to encourage you to, um, to be a part of that. When somebody comes and taps you on the shoulder, it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes of your of your afternoon or some point during the day. I want to read you a passage of scripture. Um, you can start the, uh, the Haiti screen up there. Um, we, um, most of you know that we were planning a, a trip to Haiti uh, first part of February, and that did not work. Um, there were, what, 10 of us signed up initially? Six of us? No, there were more than that. Um, well, let's go in between. Let's say there were eight of us. I think there were... Anyhow, everybody started... Ha it, this is, this, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It wasn't because there wasn't funds. It was because it just wasn't going to work. This medical appointment, this doctor's appointment, this, this something, my family, it just wasn't going to work, and it fell apart. And quite honestly, my heart was uh, a little bit angry. What's the matter with these people? No commitment? I mean, come on, this is Haiti. They're sick people. They're hurting people. We should, we should. So I had to work my way through that. It took me a little while, but I worked my way through that. And we were to be on the ground February 7th. That's when we were supposed to, February 6th is when we were supposed to, initially we were supposed to land. On February 7th, in case you don't 
know a whole lot of world news. On February 7th, the um, political system in Haiti basically crashed. What happens is their presidents are elected for a five-year term, and his term was up. So back in October, they had had elections, and the uh, majority, they lose one, they have to nominate or elect one-third of their Senate, and then a new president. And the two-thirds of the Senate didn't like the way the vote went. Now, that's not what we heard on the news here, but when I talk to the Haitians, they're like, oh, we, we had it, it was done, but... They didn't like it, so they kind of they, they stirred some stuff up and threw out the vote. And so in January, they tried doing it again, but there was so much conflict that they couldn't have a vote. And so February 7th, which would have been a day after we landed, February 7th, they had no president. They were missing a third of their Senate. Uh, Port-au-Prince was a disaster, which is where we would have flown into. There was rioting. They were burning cars in the street. I'm probably not doing a really good job of recruiting for next year, am I? <laughs> I want you to understand where we're, where we're at, where we're going. God shut the door. There's no doubt God shut the door. Long about that same time, we realized as a, as a leadership team here, we realized that we had been sending support to Haiti, and we blew it. We missed it. We were supposed to send um, $1,200, which is a salary for two pastors for six months. $100 a month for two pastors. And we missed that payment and we found out about it. And so I met with our elders and we decided as an elder team that we really needed to figure out what is our role going to be in Haiti? Is God just sending us down there to build a building every once in a while? Is he sending us down there to, to put a roof on a, on a building? I mean, what is it we're going to do? Are we going to go and paint somebody's house? Uh, what is that going to look like? And so we... We spent a fair bit of time as elders uh, talking about, discussing, looking at uh, what we feel God is calling us to. And uh, Ephesians chapter 4, I don't have a slide for you, but I want to read Ephesians chapter 4 uh, because I believe this is what God is, is calling us to. Uh, starting in verse 9 says, Paul says, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? He who has he who descended is the very one who ascended to the higher than the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. He's speaking about Jesus. Jesus died and he descended into the depths of hell and he defeated the enemy. And he also ascended into the heavens to sit at the right hand of the Father. We, we on board with that? And so basically what Paul is saying is he filled the universe. There's no lower that he hasn't been to and no higher that he has not been a part of. It was he, speaking of Jesus, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, and this is the part I want us to grab a hold of is verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In other words, Jesus did all of this and then he equipped evangelists, pastors, apostles, teachers. He equipped those leaders so that they could equip the body of Christ. And I have to look back and say, okay, God, what, is, what are you calling us to Haiti for? And this is what I believe God is calling us to Haiti for. It's for us to equip the local church so that they can do the work of the ministry. And I'll give you an example. It's an example I've shared many times since, I was, since we were last in Haiti. But part of what we did the last time we were in Haiti was we, had, we went and worked on a church. And so that church, along with another church, sent an evangelistic team up into the mountains to declare Jesus. And when they did that, while we were there that week, 57 people came to Christ. Now that's part of our goal and part of our role. And I want to tell you that as of yet, can I say it? As of yet, I haven't been uh, allowed to go up into the mountains and to see this and to participate into this and to be involved when they, they walk into it. You know, but what does the Bible say? Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world, right? We believe that? Okay. 
we really believe that? Okay. When I talked to Pastor Leslie about, about voodoo and about the realities, oh, oh, it's real, oh, it's real. But we don't care. I mean, if Christ is in you, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And so they go into a community, and Pastor Leslie's wife, whose name is Bernadette, Bernadette's grandfather was actually a Haitian witch doctor. He was a voodoo witch doctor. Um, and so he came to Christ several years ago. And so they simply go into a village if voodoo is practiced, and they call him out. But go ahead, try your magic. It's okay, because we have Christ in us. And it's the testimony of Christ. It's the power of Christ that then brings salvation to a village. Folks, we say, yeah, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, but... I mean, at that level, are we willing to are we willing to walk in it at that level? So, when we began to determine, okay, God, what is our now? now there's a couple things I want you to understand. First of all, I want you to understand that you've not lost your pastor. I'm not, you know, building a house in Haiti. I'm not, you know, going to be a full time liaison there. That's not what's going to happen. But there's going to be some more of that that happens. I believe it's our role to equip the saints. I believe we still have a call in this community. Okay, we're not forsaking Detroit Lakes and the surrounding area. We believe God has called us here. So, so I want you to understand that this is kind of a mission Sunday. We're talking about this, but it does not mean that we're not going anywhere else. In the process of, of this discovery time with the elders, I told them very specifically that I, I felt like God was calling, uh, specifically directing uh, me that I needed to get to Haiti so that we could meet with the pastors over there, we could meet with some of the, the folks that we are dealing with and set up a plan, set up a direction. And our elders in their wisdom, your elders in their wisdom said, well, that's okay, but you can't go alone. And, and that's wisdom, Right? I mean, I'm thinking, it doesn't make any difference. I've been there. I can go alone. And they're like, no, you, you cannot go alone. I'm giving you this setup for a reason. When we finally decided that, there was a, a pretty short list that came to my mind of people, members, people in this congregation who I know would like to go to Haiti. And so I started making those phone calls. Hey, you want to go to Haiti? Love to go to Haiti. No, oh, can't go. I mean, one day I'd get, oh, I'd love to go to Haiti. The next day it's like, oh, can't go. Uh, I called pastor friends there's, there's just three people it, within a very short period of time that just backed out so I'm like okay I got one more guy my daughter's father-in-law my son-in-law's dad He's been on 100 mission trips I'm going to ask him we, he was, we're going to be together on uh, Super Bowl Sunday and you know we had a blizzard on Super Bowl Sunday and so he was coming from Hibbing and apparently they got 30 miles out of Hibbing and said well oh, it's just too crazy we got to turn around and go back and, I'm, and I, I heard that and I thought God, what is going on? I know that Dan could go. I know that he would go. He wants to go. And I, but I didn't, I just, like, okay, I'm going to take that as a, as a closed door. So we were waiting for people to show up at my daughter's house in Lake Park, and um, our singer here, Kathy, uh, is my wife, my wife's keyboard player, is my wife's sister, and our bass player this morning is her husband, Joe. Um, they're from Monaga. And uh, Kathy and Joe were on their way to Lake Park, and Kath called, and she said, the weather's crazy, I don't know if we can see it, this is nuts, we should probably turn around, I don't know if it's worth going, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so 10 or 15 minutes later, they call back, and uh, Kathy's like, well, that's it, we turned around, we're going back to Monaga, and about that time, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law from Burgess show up in Lake Park, and in the background, you hear my granddaughter going, Grandma, Grandma, Grandma! And, and Kathy's like, what's going on? And it's like, well, Mom and Dad just showed up. Well, if Mom and Dad showed up, we should be able to make it. And so they turned around, and you're all going, okay, Super Bowl, driving, who cares? So Kath and I were finally standing together in the kitchen doing some dishes or getting some lunch ready. And she said, well, how's it going in Haiti? And I began to lay out the whole uh, spiel where we're at as a church and I said I really need to find someone to go along with my elders won't let me go without somebody I've got to find someone and she's like you should ask Joe I'm thinking Joe 
Not only did Joe not make the short list, he didn't even make the long list. I didn't even know you were interested. We, we had this conversation. We're, we're laying in a hotel. We're laying in a room. We're in, we're in Haiti. And I'm like, oh, how come I never knew this? And he's like, yeah, I was going to let you know at some point here. But Joe had, uh, God had made provision for him. He's made work provision, everything. It, it, and, and as we got there and as we began to work with and talk with the people, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that Joe was who was supposed to be. Not just, not just able to, but Joe was supposed to be with me. So, uh, Joe, let's grab a microphone. We're going to grab a couple of chairs. Um, we're going to begin to just show you. Uh, here's the op- option. We have an option of just playing a, a video, with some, some pictures and some clips, and uh, saying, well, you remember that picture five pictures ago? You can sit on that side or this side or whatever you'd like to do. And, uh, but I don't, I just, uh, I really feel like what we need to do is just simply go through picture by picture, explain to you what we saw, what we observed. If you're sitting back too far and you want to get up closer, you can sure do that. Um, this is a picture that Joe snapped flying into Port-au-Prince. And Joe and I have not rehearsed this. So anytime you want to jump in. No, it, it, it actually is one. You turn it on and hold it. Uh, this is actually one picture late. The picture before this was of a beautiful blue lagoon. And I thought, this is going to be all right. <laughs> it looked tropical. It looked gorgeous. It looked like a vacation spot. But as we got a little bit closer to the ground, I snapped another one. And we see lots of houses, and we see lots of rust. And as we get closer and closer, you start to see what you're dealing with. No, nope, keep not it. a vacation spot. Um, this is actually at the uh, missions house where we um, spent our time. I want to just kind of give you because we've talked about this a little bit. I want to kind of give you some very crude drawings of where we were at. This is the main highway that goes uh, uh, by, uh, leads, it goes back, this way it goes back to uh, Port-au-Prince and to Mibelay, and this is a highway, and if you come off of this on this gravel road, we're standing at the mission's house, isn't that a beautiful picture, isn't that amazing? Um, this was into it a couple of days because we didn't have any rain at first and everything was really, really brown, but this road goes back to a mountain uh, back here where the water sort of comes from. And here's the missions house um, that we stayed at. Now we're uh, 10 miles from uh, the major city of Mibale. Mibale is a population of 100,000 people. And so last year when we were there, the uh, water had gone out. The water comes from here. There's a, there's a creek that runs kind of by. Um, and, uh, but the, the piped water comes from a pumping station down here. And last week, or last year when we were in, in uh, Mibale, we had been without water. They had been without water at the missions house for about seven weeks. Okay? So when we got there, the first thing that Pastor Leslie did was he took us through the house and he said, Oh, look, we went into the kitchen and we got running water into the bathroom and he flushed the toilet and it kind of worked. And then we, he turned on the shower and that, that kind of worked. And then about two hours later, no water. So we're 14 months into a seven-month project. Uh, and not only is the missions house then out of water, you know, the water line kind of runs through here, but the city of Mibale, a city of 100,000 people, has not had running water for 14 months. Grab a hold of that, if you will. If the city of Detroit Lakes was out of water for 14 hours, there would be trouble. And yet we're 14 months without. Okay. Um, this is the. This is part of what God has called us to. And there's a couple of pictures. Oh, I just really, I just started grabbing pictures, and. Um, this is a leadership team. These are all elders and uh, pastors of this particular location okay the last picture a friend of mine from Pengilly which is about 15 minutes from Hibbing 
10 years ago started raising money to build a church and a school. And this is what he got accomplished before he died of cancer. He died of cancer about three years ago. This is kind of the footprint of it. The building is, oops, <laughs> see if that works. Uh, the building is 45 feet wide and it's 60 feet long. Okay, I measured off our sanctuary. Our sanctuary is 48 feet wide and it is from the front to the back right about 62 feet long. So this is about the size building that they're building. Now I want to show you. This is the building that they're currently meeting in. This building is 20 feet wide. So for perspective, if you start at that wall and you come out to right about where Joe is sitting, it's 20 feet wide. And then if we start at the stage and we come back to about this last seat, we're 20 by 45. Okay, so this... This section over here, right where the chairs are, in this section of our church, we have 78 chairs, all right? This is a school. Right now, they had 54, 54 children meeting in that school, and this is a building that sits right next to it. I'm going to tell you what. You walk inside of this building, you wouldn't store a garden tractor in there. We wouldn't do that. They have 54 children that meet in a building this size. They meet in there four to five hours a day, and the temperature gets upwards of 120 degrees in the afternoon. And this, you could see the distance. What is it? 100 feet away, maybe? A building that's three times its size. And in order to occupy, we need a roof and we need a floor. Uh, let's take another look. I know we've got some more of the... Okay, this is inside. Please notice the bricks in the back corner. I need you to notice the bricks in the back corner. Look at the walls, folks. Uh, it's a dirt floor. All these kids are dressed uh, in their school best. One corner of the classroom, they're having one class, they're having another class over here. It's divided into four sections. Someone's over there and someone's over there all facing away from each other. Keep an eye on the bricks. Okay, let's watch a little video. All we're doing is just panning. You see the holes in the wall. The bricks with the boards on top are their benches. On Sunday, they pull all the boards and the bricks out of the corner and they convert this school into a church that seats 130 to 140 people. Anything you want to say? Here's the goal. The goal is to take the footprint. Uh, we had to try and figure out how we're going to do this in a manageable way. So, yeah. You're going to notice something else about that guy in the middle. Um, the goal is to make this a manageable project. And so what we are going to do, what they're going to do is, is put four columns in the middle of this building. That's what they're asking for money for now. And then those four columns will attach to concrete stringers that run lengthwise. Concrete and rebar. And this project will cost roughly $4,000. And you say, well, 4000 bucks, Gee whiz, that's a lot. If you took Detroit Mountain over here and you cut it into thirds, take that top third of Detroit Mountain and imagine that's your starting point because that's what you've got to walk up to to get the supplies up to this. We went up in some kind of a little SUV. There were five of us. There's only room for four. So I opted to hop in the back. <laughs> we're driving up this thing. There's times when, whoa, whoa. I spent about 80% of my time in midair going up this hill. And yeah, yeah, That's see? <laughs> and so this concrete and the rebar and the cement blocks 
Again, take a third of Detroit Mountain and walk up it carrying that stuff because that's how it has to get up there. There's no other way. And so we're going to supply them. I was able to leave them with $2,000 when I was there. And our goal is to leave. And I'm, just, I'm not going to ask for an offering at the end of this. Just so you know, we have this in our missions fund already. We're going to spend the other $2,500 to get them the money to be able to do that. This is, and then what they've asked us to do is, if we can get them this, then um, uh, next January they're asking us to uh, put on a rafters and a steel roof, uh, uh, a uh, tin roof. That's, that's what we're going to do. Now, you might say, boy, pastor, it's only 45 feet. What are you bothering with columns and concrete for? Why don't you just put up rafters? I mean, here we're spanning 40 feet. We can span 60 or 70 feet if we want to, but we can't in Haiti because we don't have wood. Wood is not available. Wood is not something that the last time we were there, we were working on a project and they needed to support a beam with a, they really needed a four-foot piece of two-by-four that you and I would probably throw away. But all they had was a 10-foot piece of two-by-four. Hang on. Hang on. So this 10-foot piece of two-by-four, instead of cutting it down to fit in as a beam, Brian, what'd they do? Chopped a hole in the concrete floor. Busted out the concrete floor, dug a hole so that they could get that two-by-four down. In order, And you think, well, how backwards is that? Good night, Irene. How often can you get a 10-foot two-by-four in Haiti? That might be the only one. For us, it would be easy for me to say, well, you know what, we'll just build trusses and we'll just span that space. And that's not a problem. Well, we can't do that because they don't... Oh, let me give you a picture of how a, Haiti, how a Haitian truss works. You'll have a whole new, maybe, appreciation. You know how a truss... If you, maybe you say, well, I'm not a contractor. I don't know anything about trusses, blah, blah. These are two-by-sixes, and we would put them together, and we'd have some web in here, or some, some kind of structure to hold them together with plates. Or That's not exactly how it works in Haiti. When you run out of wood here on this piece, you just leave it sitting close and hope that something else coming up here, maybe we'll hold it up. Maybe it's a piece of half-inch plywood with three or four nails in it, holding it together. They actually, on, a, on an existing Haitian roof, on an existing church, the church that we worked on last year, they will not let us Americans up on there because they know how unsafe it is. So you don't just get to, hey, we'll just go to Menards and order up some trusses. That's, that's going to work. Okay, watch this guy in relationship to all these other people. What do you notice about, uh, about that, other than the fact that I'm white? What do you notice? I'm wearing shorts. Guess what? That's a no-no. <laughs> now, they were gracious, but pastors do not go anywhere without long pants on. There's short pants and there's long pants, and if you want to have any respect in the community and not get laughed at and get known as a pastor... And this is what you have to change your ways, Pastor Tim. Get to know him. This is a cistern out the back of, this is our same school. That's a 1,500-gallon cistern. Um, please notice the PVC coming off the corner. They catch the water that comes off the roof, and they dump it into that cistern. And that is the water for the community. That's not just for the church. That's not just for the kids. They have water. I don't know. They say how often they have water up there. It serves about a thousand people in the community when they get it to you know to a respectable level and fill it up. It's so valuable that you can barely see it, but there is a steel plate on the roof of the cistern, secured with a lock that's probably about the diameter of my finger. There's one man that holds the key to that life-giving water for the entire community. They have to go through that pastor even just to get into this bacteria ridden tank of water for life for, for life so I had the opportunity to meet with these elders and um, this is Pastor Maximo he is actually in charge of four churches in the area um, he is the pre principal of the school I want you to understand that the school with these children the average 
Um, if you've heard of an organization called Teach Haiti and you feel like you want to support an organization, support Teach Haiti. It's a great opportunity. Um, the average uh, uh, level of education for a teacher in Haiti is fourth grade. That's their average teachers have a fourth grade education. Um, so this, this body of men are deciding how we're going to change this building and um, we're partnering with them in order to be able to take this from a shell. And I got to tell you, I, I've told this before, but this buddy of mine over in Hibbing, his pastor would come over and he would sit down and tell me all about Haiti and he's talking about Pastor Leslie and he's talking about, you know, Mibale and Port-au-Prince and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, uh, you're, you know, your lips are moving, Bill, but I'm just not really hearing anything. And here we come several years later and Lonnie, one of our elders, starts telling me about Port-au-Prince and Pastor Leslie and he called it Mirabellus. But uh, yeah, we started tightening and realizing it's the same connection. It's the same connection. And this is the building that Bill began to build for these children. Here is a picture of the kids. Um, and you can see the scenery. Uh, this is what we call, they're calling it the mountain school. That's what they want us to, to know it by. Um, again, that day, Joe, temperature? Warm. <laughs> Very and very. The background, here's something very interesting about these mountains. When you look up on these mountains, it, they look absolutely desolate. As a matter of fact, we're coming out, of the, um, coming out of the summer season and headed into the rainy season now. We, as a church, okay, just so we know, Kim, never going to Haiti in March. Done. No, we're not going back in March. Uh, January, February, fine, but March, it starts raining. It rained every night, we met not, except first one. Night we weren't there. First, first night we were there, it did not rain. No rain. After that, it rained every night, and it rained for hours. And it got, you know, in, in here, in here when, it's, when it's hot and it's sticky and you're seeing those rain clouds coming, you're thinking, oh, some refreshing rain. No. That just feeds the whole system. It just gets hotter and stickier and through the night. If you have power through the night, you have a fan. If you don't, you don't. Mm -hmm. No, I guarantee you don't have power through the day. Exactly. One day. One day. Weekend. Yeah. Um, but my point was, you look in these mountains, and as you look up the mountains, they almost seem desolate. They seem barren. But when you're driving and you're looking down the mountain, any place there's a spot wider than 10 feet, there's a house or a... I use that term loosely. And there might be six, eight, ten people in it. Around this building, you look and you see nothing. But you step up to the bank and you look down and there's a shack there and there's a shack there and there's a shack there. So I asked them within walking distance of this facility, how many people are there? Thousand, fifteen hundred, two, we, we don't know. So that's when Joe says a thousand people come to use that cistern. That's what they're coming for. Shacks like this um, are... That's actually a pretty nice one. That's not a bad place. Uh, and that's just over the edge, just over the hill from where we were at. The children are amazing. I mean, joy, you've never seen more joyful kids. They're not plugged into an Xbox. They're not plugged into this or that. They're not plugged into anything. And they've got a joy that will just overwhelm your heart. You'll be captured, right? Right? She's going to cry right now. She was there last year. Sue was there last year. Um, again, I just, I really want you to understand what we're participating in. Um, that's a cistern with the lock. Uh, here we were stopping to pick up water in the city of Mibale. You just barely see the beginning of a motorcycle there. We'll get some pictures of that later. Motorcycles are their taxis. Their taxis uh, are Hajin, H-A-D-J-I-N. That's the manufacturer. They come from China. Um, $1,000 brand new. This is how they make a living. Um, but you will rarely see one person on it. As a taxi, anywhere, average I would say is three, up to five. Um, Close quarters. There you have a little kid you know, sitting up on a gas tank. Then you have the driver. And then you have people like this riding along. Is that close enough? It just, they're hanging on 
Sometimes, here's the one that got me, is all the young ladies, excuse me, all the young ladies riding side saddle. How do you do that? I mean, I can get it, but she doesn't know the driver, so she ain't touching him. I mean, she's sitting like this, going down the street. If you have four lanes of traffic, you've got four lanes of traffic and three lanes of motorcycles zipping in and out. As we're traveling down, there was one mountain road we're going down, and, and there was a truck broke down. So you're heading down this, what is it, four lanes you figure going down? Yellow lines, all, the, all yellow lines mean is they got a deal on paint because <laughs> they don't really use the... So there's a, there's a five-yard dump truck. Most of you know what a dump truck, small dump truck here in the United States would be. No semis, not a semi, a tractor, trailer, any place in the country because somebody would die. That's just the reality of it. So here's a five-yard dump truck headed down a hill, probably at a 15% grade, fully loaded with rocks. You've got rocks this big put in front of each tire because there's a mechanic underneath there taking the transmission out of this truck. And so while we're going down the hill passing him, there's a car passing us and a motorcycle passing them. Downhill. All over the place. It's, man, would I like to ride a motorcycle there? Just once. So a motorcycle's like that. I might only be once. Um, This is why the elders send people with me. You snapped that picture, Joe, why? <laughs> She's the star. She's the star. <laughs> She's vanity. Or She's it's everywhere like that. Um, this is a mango tree outside of our, uh, on our walk, we went out, uh, we walked down towards the river. Uh, and that's a gourd tree there. And the gourd tree, they go gourds just to use them as gourds. We would walk, on occasion we walked from the mission house back towards the mountain here. And it was on that walk that we saw these, these things. Again, a picture of, is this the one? Um, this is the, the field right across from the church. Now yeah, that's the one. Okay, back up. Here is the view standing outside the fence. There the truck broke down, and here is the view. This is the compound that we stay in. That's what we, when we're up in the mountains, that's the place that we stay. The mission's house, we got barbed wire around it. Um, and it's just to protect the missionaries. Pastor Leslie is very serious about protecting us when we're there. I've shared the story after the earthquake in Port-au-Prince. Um, they had rebuilt the walls around the orphanage. We could not go down to Credit Bacay is actually where it's at. It's, um, when you look at the, the uh, area of, of Haiti, Port-au-Prince is right down here. Um, you have to look at Port-au-Prince as a metropolitan area, just like we'd have White Bear Lake or, or you know, Winona or something, you know, no, no, something around the cities there. there that's what Croix de Bacay is there. Then we rode up to um, Mibale is where we spent our time, which is got to be over in here somewhere. Should Oh, yeah, here's Mibale here from Port-au-Prince there. And then uh, Las Cajabas is where we sent where we spent the last uh, Sunday we, I preached in Las Cajabas. Um, but uh, the, the orphanage in, um, in uh, Croix de Bacay, uh, shortly after the, the earthquake, um, after they rebuilt the walls there, Pastor Leslie, somebody broke into the orphanage. Um, they uh, killed their security guard. Um, they beat Pastor Leslie within an inch of his life and raped his daughter and his wife in front of him. It's a dangerous place. Credit Bacay is now so filled with gangs that he wouldn't, wouldn't take us there. And that's okay. That's, uh, that's okay. This is the church that we repaired last year. We fixed the walls. Um, there's, so we, we walked down to see this church, and there's an older lady there who lives right next to it. She fed us all last year. Um, she was uh, actually instrumental in founding the church, Right? That's what Pastor Leslie told us. So you see that table up in the front corner? That's their communion table. 
Um, while we were there last year, I propped my backside against that table just to take a break, and the leg fell off and busted, and everything went to the floor, and our guys fixed it. So while I was telling Joe that story, I walked up, and I lifted up the tablecloth, and this lady in the back just busts out laughing, man. I get it. So it literally was the butt of that joke. Um, so that's, uh, we, we replaced all the, the windows, if you call them that, um, last year and repaired the walls. Um, we're hoping to put a new uh, tin roof on that building in the future. Um, they finished up the canopy and did some decorative work on the outside, some concrete work on the outside. Um, but those are all the windows that we put in. Initially, they were flat, uh, flat pieces of cement at an angle, but because of the earthquake, they were very weak, and all those broke back in the earthquake in 04, and so last year was, uh, in 2010, rather, and so last year was when we rep- repaired those. Again, just a picture of some shanties along the way, walking down to the water. This is the the bus that we rode in last year. Um, anybody was there, That's we left the airport, got fleeced, got in there, locked the door, and headed down the road before we knew we were with our pastor friend. We really weren't sure whether we were being held ransom or what at that point in time. So here's another video for you. I was preaching in their institute. They have an institute on Saturday mornings. Uh, why don't you tell them a little bit about the dress? Tell them about what these guys... Uh, we don't really have any pictures of that, but... Well, let's see. Um, yeah, it, it's humbling. Um, okay, this is that same place. It's like, wait this for is also it. This where we eat. Go ahead. I, you know, you know it's tropical. I, I packed a lot of shirts and T-shirts, and expect that to be the the dress of the of the place. And 25 people came, riding in that truck, riding on motorcycles, riding in any way they could, walking for many many miles, and they come in, making us. They put us to shame. They are sharp. They have suits on, buttoned up to here. They've got ties on. Sweltering, I couldn't, I could hardly stand it in my shorts and my T-shirt. I would still make my way toward the door just to get air. And they sat shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to listen and learn. Four, eight, seven and a half. Seven and seven a half, seven and half hours. hours. Uh, with a, I don't know, twenty-minute break, I suppose to eat uh, some lunch that they had prepared for them. That's the other thing. Their twenty-minute lunch break to eat lunch. These guys are eating rice and beans. They pick it up. They take it back to their chair. What do they do for him and I? We sit up front at a table. They serve us pop. I looked at the cook and I said, you got to take this away. We can't sit up here. And she says, this is the only English I think she knows. If I do, I might lose my job. And she laughs and walks away. We had to sit up front in front of all those people. It's just, their hospitality is unbelievable. And their respect. And the respect for, for Christ and each other. And just uh, the way they, they present themselves and, and humble themselves is, is amazing. You have a hard time understanding. Um, we have a hard time comprehending how they live. The, the lady that served us our meals, she prepared three meals a day for us for five days. Um, this is Pastor Leon who was just interpreting for, for me. And um, he told us her story. Her husband was a pastor. Uh, while he was up preaching, some guys came in the back of the church and shot him. Point, just three shots, and then the other two shots went to elders for no apparent reason other than some people had gotten saved, and when they, when they accepted Christ in the area, they quit trafficking drugs for him. And so he was upset about that and came in and shot this pastor. And so this woman came, and she served us three meals a day, 
cooked them in a sweltering heat over a gas stove, and two days she was sicker than a dog. I mean, she was, we blessed the food just to make sure that we weren't getting what she had because it was not good. She was sick, but she did that. So she, there she is, a widow, and she's got five children. And she did that for just about nothing. I mean, literally just about nothing. And so while I'm standing there, we're having a conversation, and I'm like, you know, we got to help. So we asked Leon, how do you help? What's the best thing to do? Do I buy her a goat? I mean, that sounds silly. <laughs> hey, thanks for cooking. I'd like to buy you a goat. Uh, how about some chickens? You know, what do I do? And Pastor Leon's advice was, the best thing that you can do is to listen to the Lord. You do that. You let God tell you what to do. Okay? And then, in Haiti, in Haiti what we do is we don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. If you want to bless her, you just bless her. We do that with the apostle's handshake. <laughs> there would be a few dollar bills stuffed in there in order to do the apostle's handshake. And that's what we did. We had the opportunity to give her $100. $100 that came from this body. That little lady that opened up the church for us to go down and see, she came up and she did, we don't have a picture for her, she came up and she picked up Pastor Leslie's laundry so that she could wash laundry for him so that when she brought it back, he'd give her a couple dollars. She and her family hadn't eaten in two days. Two days. She's probably in her mid-70s. There's probably 10 people that live in a house that's that big. And none of them had eaten for two days. We don't understand it. We, don't, we can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend that. This is after the missions. <laughs> okay. All right, we got to go back. This is after the, the uh, tornado that went through. Uh, Haiti took the roof off the missions house. Um, this is what the melamine on the ceiling looks like, guys. All through the missions house, that all warped and rain came in and, and none of the ceiling fans work anymore and they finally got the lights to work. This is where we actually spent most of the time. I just wanted to show you this picture. See that chunk of bamboo? That guy... He's riding on a motorcycle, and there's only two of them, but if you got into a crowd, then he had to drive like this for a long time. You've got to hold it up because otherwise you're going to take somebody out. You got to, so now he finally had a chance to rest. But we followed him for a little while, and you watch where you get more traffic, and he's got to go up in the air with it so he doesn't take anybody out going down the highway. <laughs> and his buddy was about three motorcycles later carrying a piece of one-inch PVC uh, tube that was 10 or 15 feet long because that went to the ground on each side while he's, he's holding it up there to try and keep it from dragging on the ground. That's how they went through. Welcome to Haiti. <laughs> we were up in a church. Recognize it? We will meet on those beautiful shores in the sweet by and by. This is uh, Cas Las... We lost, we lost the cow bus, lost cow bus. This is where we were at. This is where I preached last Sunday. And um, you see how they're dressed. He talked about the guys at the meeting, and we said that night the only way anybody could beat us is if they came in with a tux, and the next day one of their elders comes walking through. And he's got a set of pinstripe tails on, man. He was dressed. These guys are sharp. They just make us look silly. Every church has a choir, it seems like. This is a congregation of about 300 people. And this is Pastor Leslie who is translating for me here. He's the one who... Um, you're not going to see it in this clip, but brother, he gets excited. I mean, you think I get excited? <laughs> I want to see if we have our next video clip here because we're running short on time. Try it one more time. Uh, they did a baby dedication while we were there, folks. They do church like we do church. Here's their communion table. Um, you've never done communion like this before. The crackers are little Ritz crackers. They're white cheddar cheese. Ritz crackers. The wine's actually a bottle of vino, so we're actually getting wine. And while we're standing there waiting, somebody came around with a shot of Purell. 
you. Everybody's washing their hands. Got about halfway around the circle before they ran out, so we made sure that we got our communion before it went all the way to the other side of the table. Um, yeah, that's pretty standard operation. That's only three people. That's a 125 cc. You know, you don't find anybody going down the road on 125 cc around here. I took this just because this is kind of a standard street. This is just normal. You see the garbage. There are areas. There are areas where, uh, in Port-au-Prince especially, where there would be a street that's, you know, a little bit wider than that or that wide. And it's supposed to be a catch basin to slow down the water because you're up in the mountains. And when it starts raining up in the mountains, that all runs down to Port-au-Prince. And as it's running down to Port-au-Prince, they have to slow the water down so it doesn't just wash everything out. But you'll find these areas that are about two city blocks long and as wide as that street. And it's nothing but a basin to slow water down. And yet it's probably filled this deep in plastic and garbage. There's just no place to deal with no way to deal with the garbage. The trash is literally everywhere. So this is just a standard street in Port-au-Prince. As we were leaving, again, the rubble is still left over from the earthquake in 2010. These little kids were in Port-au-Prince. We were on our way. This is the day that we were leaving. And we were on our way from a safe missions house. They have a safe missions house in Port-au-Prince where missionaries stay. And so we had to have fly out at 10. 10 o'clock was our flight. Um, we had to be there at 8. And so Pastor Leslie came at 6, 6.30 to come get us. It was about 12 miles. It took us an hour and 30, hour and 40 minutes to go 12 miles because of the traffic. It's that insane. So anything else you want to say? No, I, I just would like to... Church is the extension of them. You don't give to a country, you give to the church. You give to your neighbor. I, I felt, I felt continually, I needed to remind myself, this is not a project. This is not a project. These are people. These are people who are not here by choice. It's not because there's foolishness. They're just, the average wage in Haiti is $200 a year. That's the average. And if that's the average, you know there are a lot of highs and a lot of lows. And that's the average. And they, they hold relationships at such a high value, you can't even imagine it. When I told Pastor Leslie, I said, we have people in our congregation who say, maybe we should just send all that money. Just, just so don't bother going over there immediately. I didn't even get the sentence out of my mouth. No, 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 you need to know, we need to know each other. We need to know each other. He would have none of that. It's about relationships. Yes. Um, the, I, I shared with you that 
Pastor Leslie was beat within an inch of his life, and here's he's their pacifist, folks. They don't they they wouldn't do anything. They'd never bring charges. The man that beat him up, one of the three men that beat him up, actually came to him about three weeks, four weeks after. and asked for 50 bucks so he could feed his family. And he gave it to him. He gave it to him. Can, can we walk in that kind of forgiveness? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. The, the depth that they care for one another and the forgiveness that they walk in every day is... Uh, it, does anybody have any other questions? I, I'm just, I want to just, anybody? Yes. When you, you had told me that you had talked to him about church growth. Did you share that with him? We deal with, we deal with church growth in the United States as in we're up one week, we're down one week. We have, you know, churches got 70, 80 people in it. We here have been upwards of 150 since I've been here and we've down, been down as low as 40. That does not happen in Haiti because of the absolute need. And this is about the church being the church. I just want to say this. This is about the church. When you, when you accept Christ and you come in, you're part of the family. If, if, you, if somebody has a need, it's not about giving 10 bucks until next week. It's about doing life with them. And so they don't leave the church. When they come in, they don't leave. Man, they're there. They just keep on growing and, and growing, and the church grows because they, these people need Christ. They need the body of Christ. I'll give you one more. I know, I, we're running late, and if you need to leave, by all means, I, I certainly understand it. Um, when we fed 5,000 people out here in our parking lot last year, and it took us uh, a week to do that, um, one day I was coming up the basement stairs and I'm carrying a kettle of beans and I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to do this in Haiti. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to chill on that one for a while. And so we had a business meeting with Pastor Leslie and I told him that story and I said, I think this is what we're supposed to do. I said, are the people around here open to the gospel? Oh, yes. I said, are they open to the church? Oh, yes. So I told them. I said, you know, you got this beautiful hill that rolls away. I said, what about us setting up some tables down there, and we'll bring in rice and beans and chicken, and we'll cook, we'll cook for 1,000. I said, we fed 5,000. He said, you mean 500? I said, no, I mean 5,000. I said, we, we'll cook. We're here at the missions house. Um... Yeah, we're here at the mission cell, so it would be this way. There's a 30-acre field here. And I said, well, set up down there at the bottom. And I said, on a Saturday, you could have all your pastors get up and preach and talk about Jesus and tell people about Jesus. And then we could set up the Jesus video. We were able to bring down a video projector. We brought down an entire system, a self-contained, battery-operated, solar uh, uh, video system that they can show the Jesus film, which is a two-and-a-half-hour video. It's the entire book of Luke. We brought that down and... I mean, Pastor Leslie broke into his happy dance. Anyhow, I said, we could set that all up down here. And he, and he, and he was, again, going around with dude like, we got, we got help. People are going to help us. And, I, and he, then he said to me, he said, does it have to be that way? And I said, no, it, it, however you want to do it. And he said, he said, uh, so before I die, He's 57 or 58. Average lifespan of a man in Haiti is 52. And he's been beaten badly, so he's on borrowed time. He said, before I die, I want to plant three churches because some, some mistakes I've made in ministry. And this river right here, he's got five families right now, 10 people, roughly, that cross the river and take this road to church every Sunday. They walk to church. It's about five miles. When a rainy season come, the river, comes, the river swells so they can't get across it. In order for them to make it, they'd have to come nearly nine or ten miles to church. So he said, my goal is to plant a church down here. He said, could we do that next year? 
Could you take part of your team and put rafters on the church and take part of your team and do them? Could you do that? Could we take that down here and feed people down here? And when we feed people, preach the gospel? You could preach. You could preach. And I said, no, you could get your pastors. They'll preach. Oh, no, no, you preach. And I said, no, you get your pastors. No, 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 you preach. So I think I'm going to preach. Um, and then we'll set up the Jesus video and we'll let them watch the Jesus video. These people in this area down in here and then up in the mountains have never seen TV. Some have. You get around me belayed. They, they have TV when they have power. But his goal is to do a crusade to see people saved. I said, how many people do you think would come to a meeting like that? How many people would you be feeding? Oh, three, four, five hundred. All right, let's do it. Why? This is what we have the opportunity to do, folks. This is what I believe God is calling this congregation to be a part of. And I'll share two dreams, and then I'm going to be done, okay? Dream number one, Lonnie Prine is not here. Lonnie is one of our elders here. Lonnie, about four years ago, told me a dream that he had after he had been to Haiti. He was in the apartment of Joel June. For those of you who do not know Joel June, he's a Haitian missionary. He was born in Haiti, raised in Haiti. He died in Haiti when he was about a month old. His dad was a pastor. His dad was an evangelist going up into the mountains. Joel died when he was about a month old and they tried to find his dad and they couldn't find his dad and they kept his body for three days before they finally put him in a casket at a month old. And they had a mourning team. They're walking down the road and they're crying and the baby has been dead now for four days. And dad comes down out of the mountains. And dad says, well, what's going on? And they said, well, your, your baby passed away four days ago. And he said, oh, no. When he was born, there was prophecy that he was going to be a great evangelist. He's not going to die. The devil's not going to take him. And that dad laid over that casket and wept over that casket for three hours until they started hearing a baby cry. And babies are not allowed in funeral processions. And so they opened the casket and Joel June was alive. Right? He is now an evangelist traveling throughout, covers Haiti. Lonnie had a dream that he was in Joel June's apartment. And Lonnie had met Joel down in Florida. And, and he said, while he was in this apartment, Joel June spoke to Lonnie and said, I have gifts that I need to deliver. But somebody's got to open up the floor so I can deliver them. And Lonnie's a construction guy, and so... He's with Gospel Crusade. Yep, yep. No, no, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. In this dream, Lonnie said, well, I can open up the floor for you. So he broke the floor open. This is a dream Lonnie had eight years ago. Eight years ago, I think it was. Lonnie told me that dream about three years ago. He said, you're one of the few people I've ever told that dream to. Last year when we had Pastor Leslie here, and we were taking him around, Pastor Leslie said, let me tell you about a dream that I had. He said, I was in an apartment, and Pastor Joel June was upstairs. He was in an apartment above me. And all of a sudden, his floor was open, and somebody was throwing boxes down to me, throwing gifts down to me. And Lonnie was the one who opened that floor up. How many years ago? And folks, I believe, I believe with all of my heart that's what God is calling us to do is to be, to make that thing come true. And you look around and you go, oh, there are 50 of us, or 60 of us, what are we going to do? We're going to do whatever God gives us the ability to do. Amen? And then he's going to cause the increase. He can do that. I can't do that. I'm not going to go out and beg, borrow, and steal. We're not going to go out and do it. We're going to try and just be obedient to what We raised almost $20,000 this past year for missions, and you never heard me ask for a dollar once. How did it happen? I don't know. This happened. People just gave to missions. 
We never took a special offering. We did one time, we did a meal downstairs, and we raised about 600 bucks. That's it. You know what? We're just going to do what God calls us to do. We're just going to be faithful. Amen? 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 I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to do something really different. Okay, Lord, we just thank you. I thank you for each person here. I thank you for their patience. I thank you that they've been willing to, to sit and listen. God, I pray that you would connect us. You would, you would give us a heart to say whatever it is you want us to do. Whatever it is you want us to do, God, we want to be open to that. We want to be open to that. Lord, I just ask you to bless each person here. God, I, again, I'm just grateful for their willingness to sit and listen to a couple of guys just mumble through their heart. But I believe that you have a heart for Haiti and you have a purpose for us there. So God, I just thank you for each person here. Today, folks, is our communion Sunday. And um, you know what? Why don't you just stand and come to the front and let's pull these chairs out of the way. Let's do, let's do communion Haitian style. How's that? Let's just grab a chair and throw it off to the side. I'm going to set the table out here. And we're just going to stand and read a couple scriptures together. Can you help me, Bruce, move this? I know, this is crazy. What is our pastor up to now? We don't know. It's all right. No, don't stand back there. Stand up here. Come on up around here. There we go. Let's just stand around this, the, the table together. Let's just stand around the table together. Communion is about celebrating family. It's about celebrating the life of Christ. Come on, just come on in. It's okay. It's okay. We're going to do something different. It's okay. Is it okay? Sure. Good. Let's grab this step and put it up there so I don't trip over backwards. Come on in. Make room. Spread out wide. It's fine. I want to read you two passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, and tech team, come on down. You know you're fine. Come on, just let it be. This is about communion. This is about celebrating the body and the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, the cup, of the, blessing that, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are of one body, where we all partake of one bread. And then in John chapter 6, Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. There were people that, were, that accused the disciples of, of being cannibals because they talked about eating and drinking the blood of Christ. But we know that Jesus died for us. And when he died for us, we participate in that life by the blood by the body and the blood of Christ. We recognize that, that we're taking a piece of bread, but this symbolizes his body. His body that was beaten for us. His body that was bruised for us. His body that bought our healing. His body that we're all part of. Right? That's what that's about. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them in the last day for my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven that you're... Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. I'm just going to encourage you. Grab a piece of bread, grab a glass of juice, and we're going to pray together, and we're just get on up there. And This is not cannibalism. This is saying we are participating in. We're part of the same body. It's the blood of Christ that washes away our sin. It's the blood of Christ that cleanses us. It's the blood of Christ that, that makes this eternal, ongoing covenant for us. It's not a covenant that's made with human hands. It is a covenant in His blood, and it's about His body and His blood.
scripture tells us that before we eat, we need to consider our ways. So we're going to take 30 seconds, and I'm just going to tell you, if you've got unforgiveness in your heart, extend forgiveness. If you've got a hurt, forgive that hurt. If you've got something going on, ask God to forgive you, because otherwise, he says, if you eat and you drink this and your heart's not worthy, you drink guilt and damnation and sickness upon yourself. This is as crazy as it seems, folks. This is really a holy moment. So let's just take 30 seconds, and if you... If you need to get right with God, then get right now. God, today we recognize that this body is symbolic of your body. This bread is symbolic of your body, the bread of life. And you have taken the punishment of all of our sin in your body. You've purchased our healing. You've purchased our salvation. God, you did all of that so that we can walk in freedom and we can walk in relationship and we can walk in a new life. We acknowledge that today, God, and we recognize that, and we eat this bread together. Let's eat together. This juice, God, is a representation of, of the blood of Christ, the blood that, that wiped away all of our sin, that covered over our sin, that took away our sin. It's the blood that gives us the opportunity to walk in right relationship with you, God, this is what gives us the ability to stand before you. It's not anything that we've done. It's about the blood of Christ. You have forgiven our sins through the blood. And so, God, we, we acknowledge that. It's not, of, it's not of our own doing. Salvation is not of our own doing. It, is, it comes solely through you. And so, God, I pray right now that we would recognize the value of the blood of Christ as we drink it together. Let's drink together. I thank you for this day, God, and I thank you for these people. I thank you for our friends in Haiti. I ask you, God, to pour out your grace on them, help them experience your grace in your life and your protection. Bless this body right now here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again so much, and uh, we'll just gather up the cups and throw them in the garbage, and you're dismissed. Have a great day. for joining us for today's broadcast. You are also invited to join us in person Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. Viewers like you help to make this program possible. If you'd like to help, send your tax-deductible contributions to the address on your screen or give online at cfcdl.org. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, we'd love to hear from you. Comments can be sent to us online or write to us at the address on your screen. Thanks again for joining us. See you next week.